Thank you, Peter. Uh, thank you, Yali, for the welcome. Thank you, Rainer and the organisers for the opportunity to speak at this great symposium. Um, you know, when we think about the exciting advances in infectious disease and uh, when we talk to our the lay, lay people about it, it, of, it often comes down to laboratory discoveries or clinical trials and new, new drugs, new vaccines and the more biotechnological side. Um, but in fact, as we all know, that's really just the start of what needs to be done. And once those things are proven as, have, as having evidence that they work, that's when the real job begins. And I think Graham alluded to that very nicely in talking about all the, the implementation of, of the reality of malaria programs. Um, and once that begins, there is a, still a huge research task to be faced. And that research task involves figuring out whether what you're doing is actually reaching the people it needs to reach and whether it's actually working for them and if you need to make some sort of mid-course corrections and, and uh, keep, keep going and tracking it to get it right along the way. And this is where <coughs> surveillance comes in. It's the, all the stuff, all the research, the data collection analysis that is done after what we think we know is discovered and implemented and we have to track it. In, in, so people looking at it from the, the development pathway often think of it as phase four, uh, phase four trials, phase four research. Um, but from a public health perspective, it's really just trying to get stuff that, that works. So what I'm gonna do in, in my part of this program is try to, uh, uh, using a couple of really important infectious diseases uh, as, as uh, to illustrate in, in the Australian context, um, how routine data, what you might think of as fairly uh, routinely collected data that comes to us from administrative sources or, or laboratories, uh, play, can play a crucial role in the task of figuring out whether our programs in infectious disease are working, but also indicate the limitations to the use of these sort of data. And in that process, try to illustrate the, the theme of the title of my talk, which is that this stuff is not boring. This is not, this is not the mundane, humdrum side of, of public health programs. This is really where the rubber hits the road and the real benefit to people can result. But we have to assess it scientifically just as much as we have to do in the early part of the research that takes place in the laboratory and in the clinic. Um, and the, the whole process is, the, the, key, the, the key points about this process, I'm, gonna, I'm just, I'm just going to list out now, these are my concluding points, but I'll start with my concluding points and then hopefully by the time that I've reached the end of my talk, you'll have been convinced by these points. Now, does this, does this advance the... Uh, yeah. Um, She's a very good cartoonist, I thought. <laughs> mm. I'll just use the button. All right, I'll just use the button. All right. Um, okay, so... So the first point I have to make is that if we're going to do this, this phase four, this, this phase four task, we do need, for every disease control strategy we put in place, we need national recognised comprehensive surveillance plans. And in most disease control situation, we actually lack these. There are a few examples in which, in this country, we've had such plans, but very few. We also need agreed roles and responsibility about who's doing what in implementing these plans and surveillance. We also need standardised and improved technical procedures for accessing routine data, which sit in clinics or sit in laboratories, but are take, often take years and procedural difficulties and um, computer challenges to actually get hold of. And these are really data on testing and treatment in relation to infectious diseases. Um, I think it's also important that we recognise better how much benefit we can gain from linking data sources and the number of experts on, on data linkage in, in, in the room here and, and uh, has been very, had a very successful strategy in, in, in getting answers about how we do better to control infectious diseases. But it's often, again, a big struggle to get all the approvals and processes in place for linkage, despite a lot of advances in that area in, 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 uh, in some jurisdictions in New South Wales has been a good example. Um, but on the other hand, we also need to recognise that the routine data collection 
that comes from the routine sources such as laboratories and clinics is only part of the story and we do need to spend money on filling the gaps that the strategy that the surveillance plan needs to really answer the questions about what's working and what's not working. So those are the, the points that I, I hope you will be left with at the end of this, uh, this uh, presentation, but also particularly the idea that there is a lot of excitement there and there's, what, the, the work I'm presenting today actually is the, the, is the compilation of, of work, some, some which I've been involved in, I've been involved in, some which my different colleagues have been involved in, but which actually comes up, has produced a number of PhDs, a number of uh, NHMRC grants have been de de dedicated to this work, so it is, is by no means mundane or boring in terms of its impact and it's, it's also led some of this work has led the world in terms of, of the key assessment of implementation of, of, of uh, uh, control programs for infectious disease. So let's just have a quick think about how we, this is a, in a bit of an abstract sense, what does it actually mean to control infectious disease? And, and this, this next, this slide is, is, is really just a sort of a, a bit of a schematic list of the different strategies we have for controlling infectious disease and, and the, the emphasis in each category is different for every disease. We think about some diseases we have primary prevention where we try to reduce exposure. That might be in different ways, such as for a, a, a foodborne disease, we try to make sure that, that food isn't contaminated. Then we also think about primary prevention to reduce susceptibility, and the best example of that is, is a vaccine. But for, for HIV, we have uh, male circumcision, which also reduces susceptibility. Then we have secondary prevention strategies to detect and 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 uh, if if uh, detected then to treat an infection or to treat an early stage of infection so it doesn't progress to the next stage. And finally we have treatment would actually to, to alleviate or ideally to cure but not always to cure but to, to uh, alleviate the more advanced symptoms or con uh, as, uh, consequences of an infection. And with infectious disease there is a particular aspect of treatment which is which is really very different to non-communicable conditions, which is that treatment actually becomes part of prevention because by even by curing an infection or even by reducing its infectiousness through treatment, you actually can break the cycle of transmission. So treatment is crucial to prevention. And we hear about treatment as prevention for HIV, but it's, it's, it's actually valid for, for many infectious diseases. And of course, for every disease, all these strategies need to take place within an enabling legal, social and economic environment. So we can't just put things in place necessarily without making sure those strategies, those, those factors are in place. So where do our public health data fit in? How do we bring our public health data to bear once we've got some of these strategies in place? <coughs> well, we need to make sure that people are getting, we need to track that people who are at risk of infections are getting access to the infection, the, the interventions that we know work. We need to make sure the coverage is high. It's not just access, it's actually coverage so the interventions are actually being delivered. We need to measure that the interventions are having a direct outcome in those people. So are we actually seeing what's supposed to happen? So if you offer someone a, uh, uh, some counselling to reduce the risk behaviour for HIV, are they actually reducing their risk behaviour? And then getting to the, the actual infection itself, we need to measure that we're actually seeing changes in the incidence of the infection. And that sounds very obvious, but as we'll see from a number of examples, with my examples, it's even for some of the most important infectious diseases, we don't actually measure this very well. Uh, and, and then often we forget that we're not just trying to figure out how to reduce the presence of the infection, we also need, as part of the overall strategy for controlling a disease, to make sure that we're supporting and dealing with the people who, who are already have the infection and to, re to reduce the illness or mortality associated with it. And the, we need to look at these things by time and by particular subpopulations at risk and we have to really focus on those subpopulations that may be more susceptible. So to answer those questions, public health data can really answer some very important questions. They can say whether the known interventions that have been proven by evidence, are they in place, are they actually uh, have been delivered? Are they having the expected effect? We should be able to track that by looking at the correlation between where they've been implemented and the, any changes in, over time or in different populations. And if not, what can we do about it? And to answer those questions and to do those, that service for public health, every disease control strategy 
needs a data strategy to go with it. And this is very often, or most often, is, is lacking. And this is, a really, I really emphasise that this is not about discovering new basic knowledge about how to control disease. This is just making sure that what we think we know is being delivered to the people who need it. So I'm going to illustrate by two infections that I've uh, had a lot to do with in my research career. H HPV, I was, I was actually involved in HPV research long before I got involved with HIV research. I was at the International Agency of Research on Cancer in the, in the 80s. Um, and then I became involved in HIV research. In fact, uh, that was probably the, uh, the, the, long, the longest period of my career. And actually, more in the last few years, I've become involved again in HPV. Um, apart from differing by, by one, one letter, these, uh, these two infections have a lot in common. They're, they're global, global epidemics of, of huge proportions. Um, they're both sexually transmitted infections. We know that these infections can be acquired by other routes, but the fundamental route of transmission for both these infections is sexual transmission. They are really major causes of, of serious illness and death. HIV still accounts for over one and a half million deaths per year. Um, HPV, human papillomavirus, so I probably should have spelled that out. Uh, human papillomavirus accounts for uh, over a quarter of a million deaths due to cervical cancer, mostly in the developing world, and, and probably that, the same number again of, of, of deaths due to other forms of cancer that, that are uh, squamous cell carcinoma being the main, the main consequence. They're also currently the subject of intense research and control activities. We, we hear a lot about HIV uh, in, in, the, in the media recently, especially the conference that we just had in Melbourne, and as I mentioned already, the, the idea of test and treat and make sure we get access to treatment for, for everybody has been a huge theme of the last, last few couple of years and is, is, is high, ever heightening. Uh, HPV has also, in Australia is a leading, leading the world in, in H, human papillomavirus control through having introduced the vaccine in uh, 2007. And in, in many and, and uh, it's uh, in many countries the, 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 it's, it's a really uh, hot topic as how to where to go with controlling HIV and it's a particular problem I've just been the last few days in, in Papua New Guinea where cervical cancer is the leading cause of of, uh, can, of cancer death in women and they have no vaccine no screening and no no radio, very limited access to radiotherapy for for a curative or palliative treatment so it's it's a really serious problem in many developing countries. Um, however, these two infections have very highly contrasting epidemiology patterns and very highly contrasting control strategies. And so you need very, very different monitoring mechanisms once you implement what you think you know that know, you know works to try to see if you are delivering the control strategies in the best way possible. Uh, I won't go into the detail about the epidemiology, but just one, one example. Uh, in, the, in the Australian setting, human papillomavirus is, is almost ubiquitous. It, there are many different, uh, different, di different gene types of human papillomavirus, a number of which are cancer caused, a number of which are not, some cause warts. Um, but virtually everybody from the, from the time of sexual activity acquires one or more of those strains. Uh, and it's, it's, a, it's a bit of a, a lottery as to which ones you will acquire, and particularly for, for women, and, and the risk of, of uh, urogenital cancers is, is more elevated with certain types. Um, HIV, on the other hand, in Australia, is been very largely con concentrated among, among uh, gay men, and that's been the case since the epidemic began and remains the case today. Of course, it's not the case in many other parts of the world. If you go to Africa, uh, it's very much uh, very, very, very different situation. But, but in Australia, the epidemiology of these, of these two infections could not be more different. So I'm going to go through. HIV control strategies and go through HPV control strategies and talk about some of the really exciting work that's being done and the, the, the challenges that are being faced by public health surveillance systems and researchers working with public health surveillance systems to try to make sure that what we think we know works is actually rolling out and working. So what are the main HIV control strategies? Well, from right back in the beginning we knew that risk behaviour, ways to Interventions to control, control risk behaviour, that's all we had in the beginning. Advising people about the risk of, of, uh, of, of, of sex without condoms with people who, uh, with, with so-called casual partners is, was the, was the catch, catch word, but in many African countries it wasn't. It was your, your spouse who was your most at risk for your spouse. So, so the, the behavioural issues are quite challenging in different contexts, but behavioural prevention, whether it's through sexual transmission or through blood, uh, blood contact and the use of needle and syringe distribution to prevent uh, transmission among people who inject drugs. Various behavioural strategies 
were the beginning and still continue to be the, the mainstay of, of control. Um, a, a very recent development in the, in the uh, primary prevention has been the use of chemoprophylaxis, use of antiretroviral drugs. There's a pilot program begun in, in Victoria and soon beginning in New South Wales using a treatment uh, with these drugs to people who haven't got HIV to prevent them acquiring HIV. But in Australia, it's still a very, this is a, it's in brackets, but it's actually a very small component of our, of our control strategy. Uh, in Africa, male circumcision has become a very important strategy, but it's not, is, in Australia it's not recommended as a public health strategy at this stage, although some people do strongly pr uh, promote it. Um, the diagnosis and treatment of, of other sexually transmitted infections has been controversial as a strategy to control HIV. It's important in its own right, but there's been an ongoing debate for many years as to whether it is a major component of, of control for HIV and the, and the, the pendulum seems to swing back and forth. But what has become re emerged recently is testing for secondary prevention. So, so increased testing will make people aware of their HIV status. Those that haven't got HIV from the testing can uh, be, be aware of prevention, uh, heightened awareness of prevention. Those that have can be referred to possible treatment uh, if they so desire. Um, a subset of that is screening of blood and tissues, which has taken place since 1984 and 85 in this country very effectively. Um, and then the other big headline is, is as I mentioned before, treatment. So, so if somebody gets on, if somebody's diagnosed positive, they, they see a, 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 a doctor who then can discuss with them the possibility of starting treatment either, uh, and, and the, the, the policy now is to encourage treatment at earlier and earlier stages. Uh, I'll put as a bit in a brackets, prevention of mother to child transmission has been very effective in Australia through and, and, and many parts of the world through um, several strategies. Uh, I won't talk about that in detail because that's, that's really uh, quite a settled issue in HIV. So the focus really is on the behavioural preventions and the test and treat. They're the big ones in HIV now. And how well are we doing in measuring the coverage of these interventions in the Australian setting? And we can look at the, diff the, diff the, the answer to these questions are different in almost every country, but I'm again focusing on, on what's happening in Australia. Um, so if you want to think about measuring the coverage of various health education or information activities, we don't really measure this comprehensively at all. That work takes place, but we don't have a systematic way of measuring it. Uh, condom distribution, which is also an important part of HIV prevention, we, we don't have a systematic way of recording that at a, at a, at a state and national level. These are things that take place, but we don't really track them. Clean needle and syringe distribution, we do, we do track, uh, as, as of last year we've started national compilation of information, so we do actually know how many needles and syringes we give out. We don't know much about exactly who gets them, but at least we know how many we're giving out on a regular basis. So that's, that's in red, and I'm, in, in, I'm going to use that red and black distinction for the rest during my talk to show you what's, we've, what, what's really happening and what's, what's not really happening that much. Um, what about the next step? About having, not, that, that was access and uptake. What about measuring what's happening as a result of these interventions? So how do we measure the direct outcome of interventions to reduce uh, exposure to, to HIV? Well, there, we do quite well in tracking sexual risk behaviour among people most at risk. We also do quite well at measuring injecting risk behaviour among people who inject. And for a number of years, we've been recording through, through uh, a national systems tracking undetected anal intercourse among, among, with casual partners among gay men through what's called the community periodic surveys of a number of, a number of states and territories. And with, uh, with the same thing, we look at the reuse of clean needles, of, of needles, syringes among people who are surveyed every, uh, once, uh, once a year, I think it's uh, usually October, still in October, through the National Needle and Syringe Program survey that, that uh, have we've been coordinating since 1994. So these are very effective methods of tracking behavioural prevention. Um, what, now, testing is, a, is the big new thing. How well do we track the coverage of testing? We do, we, we are, this, is, this has been, since the, I started first working in this field, this has been one of the biggest challenges of all, to actually get data. I mean, it sounds, this is an unbelievable source of frustration, and you, to think that, you know, in the, in the world of the internet and, uh, you know, everyone's got so much technology at their disposal in their, in their hand, we can't actually, it's, it's, we can't actually get laboratories to systematically report in, to, to a central point the amount of tests, HIV tests being done uh, for the purpose of public health uh, program evaluation is astonishing. And it's, 
we've had very, very great difficulty in compiling this information. It's not just true for HIV, you talk to any area of infectious disease to get information on how much testing is done, whether it's for chlamydia, whether it's for pertussis, whether it's for influenza, to get that information in one place is just beyond laboratory the, the, the standard information systems. And this, I think, is actually a bit of a scandal that we should, if, if there's one thing we should try and do together across the infectious disease area in Australia is to really try to find ways for the laboratories to do standardised reporting on the amount of testing they do in different areas. So HIV is just one example. Now, New South Wales Health has, has uh, you're probably aware that New South Wales Ministry of Health has a very, uh, has pretty strongly emphasising HIV control over the last a few years and have a new strategy which has very ambitious targets and one of the things that actually, they actually have succeeded uh, probably more than anybody else in Australia at compiling information on testing um, and actually uh, have started to track that data. You can see that little green line at the, on the left uh, which is just for the first few months of 2014 a suggestion that, that they're, they're actually having some effect. It looks it's, it's small but this is, you know, this is early days and it's, uh, they're ready to be congratulated for, for finally pulling this together. It sounds it's sort of embarrassing, but it's, it's true that we really haven't had this information. Um, there's also more information on where the testing is being done. Um, and, uh, and you can also get information on, on testing from this, the, the community periodic surveys where the question is asked both to gay men about having been tested and, and the people who inject drugs through the, the needle and syringe programs. Um, Finally, coverage of treatment, we can get information on national data reporting on antiretroviral prescriptions and also from clinical records, that's not too bad. Um, and as a result, um, the mathematical modelers at, at our institute, uh, led by David Wilson, have been able to put together an estimate of what's called the care and treatment cascade, which is the proportion of people who, are being, who have HIV in Australia who are diagnosed and the proportion who are under treatment and the proportion that have, have a detectable, undetectable viral load. And this is the key, the key parameters for tracking how well we're implementing these test and treat strategies. Um, we're, not so, we're not doing so well on that key indicator that I mentioned before, the incidence of new HIV infection. We're doing actually very badly on that. We don't have a measure of that. All we do is have as a surrogate is the new number of new diagnoses, which is not the incidence of new infection. This is a challenge around the world, and we have to make the best, do it the best we can. Uh, but we can actually also look at the prevalence of infection in certain populations as, as a, another way of tracking, uh, as, a, as a, a surrogate for incidence. Um, and I'll just uh, draw your attention to, so, so New, again, New South Wales, there's a focus on tracking the, the recency of infection in terms of, by, by looking not just at the fact of someone being diagnosed, but looking at their CD4 count as a marker of how early in the course of infection they've been diagnosed. And that's an indication of of how recent their infection has been acquired. Um, one thing that we can, we can do in direct measurement is through the National Needle and Syringe Program Survey to actually keep a track on this population that's at highest risk of HIV in many countries, the people who inject drugs. And we've seen just, then if you look at that curve, it looks a little bit alarming until you look at the prevalence of the percent on the side, which is still around the 1% mark, but there is a bit of a, a sign that the last couple of years it's crept up to around the 2% mark, which is the first time we've seen that in this country and, and something we need, do need to keep an eye on. Now, I know I'm probably just reached the end of my time, I've just got the end, to the end of my first disease, but I, I would like to just, if, I, if you don't mind, spend about three or four minutes on, on, on human papillomavirus. Um, I think I've got a late start, didn't I? Yeah. yeah and through, uh, so, so will I be committed to maybe just uh, talk to you about human papillomavirus for five minutes? So, can I have both papers? Three minutes. Three minutes, yeah. Um, okay, so, so, so as I mentioned, the human papillomavirus is a very different epidemiology and very different control strategies to HIV. The vaccination of adolescents, which started with, with uh, adolescent girls, 12 to 13 year olds, in 2007 and was extended to boys, same age, in 2013, has been the mainstay, has been the new, the, the new mode. Um, but before that and continuing, we had, we had the, the, uh, the PAP test. So, so a screening of women uh, every two years recommended for early detection and treatment of, of precancerous uh, changes in, in the cervix. So that have been the two main phases of control. But one thing we often forget about, in, in, because this is a disease control strategy, we also need to be thinking of an, an uh, anal precancer. We also need to be thinking of, of not just the, 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 the screening and the, and, the, and the early lesions, but also the uh, the, so the, the, the women who are diagnosed with not with early precancer but with actually cancer, what are our strategies for making sure we have they have the best access to 
to uh, treatment and, and follow up for, for actual cancer. And that, so that's the, that's the comprehensive controls program for, for any uh, infectious disease needs to take account of the advanced manifestations, not just the, the prevention of the acquisition of infection. Um, so this, this is an area actually which you are very good at in this country. Um, what, one thing that the government did when, when they funded them to the national program, for the national vaccination program in 2007, also to fund a national registry uh, for, for, the, for, the, the, uh, um, for the vaccine. And the national vaccine registry has been invaluable. And, sh and so this, this graph is data from the national registry and shows uh, based on the age in 2007, you see that the very good coverage in the, in the girls who are younger and moving into adolescent and, and younger women, uh, the, the, the ones who are older in 2007 have, have less coverage because they, they were uh, accessing the vaccine through a different means through GPs and not, not through a school-based program, but still some coverage. Uh, and what we've seen is that year by year now we have very, we have very high levels of coverage. It's actually very consistent across all states and territories. And also, um, encouragingly, it's also very consistent across different socio-economic levels. There's really good access. So the whole point about access, this vaccine, and, and the, the latest data also suggests that access in Aboriginal women is, is equivalent to non-Aboriginal non women, which is um, often not the case. So the HPV vaccine, we have very good information that it is getting out there, the coverage is high, and the same can be expected with the boys. Um, what a, one thing we, we are at the early days of is measuring the direct outcome of the, of the interventions to reduce um, exposure. We don't really have a, so that's just looking to see if the vaccine, there's, there's not really, uh, we don't really use in like serological markers of, of vaccination. Um, but we do have very good information on coverage of, of, of screening, which is the other main modality of, of uh, prevention of, of uh, the impacts of human papilloma virus through the state and territory cytology registers. And uh, in terms of the direct outcome treatment, this is something which is, again, in, in the early days, and this is, this, is for the, a very, this is a very exciting new finding which was published a couple of weeks ago in the Lancet Infectious Diseases. Um, we actually have the first data looking in detail at the prevalence of, of infection in young women, comparing the ones who are uh, the pre-vaccine cohort of women to the ones uh, in, in, who had received the vaccine, um, and and this this uh, is, is I guess the key slide from that, that paper which came out a couple of weeks ago, um, and and you see this this compares the, the blue and the red is the pre and the post vaccine uh, women aged uh, 18 to 24, and you can see that there's a, there's a reduction in different categories of HPV types, but the most dramatic reduction is on the on the right there, which is the types of uh, the genotypes that are actually in the vaccine. So, as you might expect, so it's actually seen the big reduction in the genotypes that you'd expect to see because that's the ones that are in the vaccine. Um, th that same paper also had produced some intriguing findings about the possibility of herd immunity because there was actually lower prevalence of the same genotypes in women who actually had not received the vaccine, even though they're in the post vaccine cohort. So, it suggests that they may be getting protection uh, just by the fact that there's less of the, the infection around. And also on the right there, there's some indication of cross protection to types that weren't uh, cross protection against types that actually are genetically related that actually weren't in the vaccine. Um, we're having a field day with warts. There's, there's uh, genital warts is also is caused by, by type 16 and 11, which are actually in the in the, uh, the, the the vaccine construct that's used in Australia. And there's very good data for a number of sources. Now there's there's actually a recent paper from a group that the University of New South Wales published a couple of weeks ago in general infectious diseases. There's some, a lot of work published from the Kirby Institute in number of paper in the BMJ last year by Ahmad Ali. Um, and so there's, there's been a flurry of work around, around genital warts. We're really covering the field very nicely. There's, there's not a national registry of warts, but we have hospitalisation data, we have self-reported data from a survey that, that Betty Lee and I were involved in. We have um, data from um, sexual health clinics, so all sorts of different sources of data on warts, and we are very clear that warts are disappearing. It's, it's a very good sign. Um, and then the, other, then the, the last uh, indicator I'll just refer to, and I'll and close in a minute, Peter, is, uh, is the, uh, the incidence of the, those early, those precancerous changes that the vaccine is, is the, the, what was, are screened for in, in, uh, uh, by using the, the PAP test. 
and we are seeing a, a decline in those early, early lesions. And if you see that, that the line there that's going downwards is that the, uh, the age group that has had, had the vaccine, the vaccine cohort, uh, and that's, that's exactly what you'd hope to see and to see it very dramatically. Um, I, probably you're, you're aware that in 2016, Australia's approach to cervical screening is going to completely change. The PAP test strategy, the universal PAP test strategy will, be, will, be, will go, go and be replaced by a, for women at the starting at age 25, screening for eight high-risk HPV genotypes. And then those who have a high-risk type will then be followed up with other strategies. But that will give us much, so we'll have much less data on, on uh, psychological abnormalities, like this, these sort of data, but we'll actually have a, a, a huge amount of data on HPV types um, you know, across a much wider, wider range of women uh, than, we, than that little survey that, that I showed you a minute ago. So, to conclude, I'll just repeat the, and I, hopefully by this brief tour of, of the exciting work that takes place using routine data, and a lot of these data are just data you get from, from come out of laboratories, come out of clinics, come out of hospitals, data that are obtained through service provision. But I also showed you that you do need to have special surveys to complement that, that information if there are gaps. So those points that I made at the beginning, I'll repeat them just in case you haven't noted them down. First of all, we need every disease, communicable disease that we try and control, we need a nationally recognised comprehensive surveillance plan to go with it. We also need to know who's doing what. That might sound trivial, you might just think, well, of course those people up in the health department, they collect the notification data, they're doing, this notification, they're doing the, the surveillance. But notification data, is only one small component. So, for example, they collect the HIV notification data, they don't collect the data on people attending needle and syringe programs, they don't collect behavioural data on gay men, they don't collect the trip, they've got all those different things that you need. And similarly with HPV, HPV is not even a notifiable disease. Cancer of the cervix is notifiable, but that's the only thing that takes, that takes place decades after you get the HPV, so it's a bit late to be tracking uh, using, using that notification. That's, that's a cancer registration issue, but it's a bit late. Let's try and fix this technical issue about getting decent data from labs in a, in a timely and centralised manner so we can actually understand what our, our, our positive data are telling us. This is something which can be fixed. Um, there are very clever people out there, but they just don't seem to be at the right place at the right time and we, we need to solve this problem. And it's, and it's not something which we need to, and So a lot of this stuff needs to take place prospectively. And a, a, lot, of, a lot of these analyses that I've presented today have been constructed retrospectively. So someone is trying to think, well now how do we evaluate the impact of these, of these interventions? What data are there out there? That's backwards. We need to be thinking about it at the time when the intervention is being implemented and put together these surveillance plans and go forward with the data collection uh, and monitoring in the real time of the, of the program, not retrospectively after it's, uh, it's all done. Public health benefit, I, I didn't actually show you, I, I skip, had to skip these, there's a couple of examples of linkage, how valuable linkage can be in giving greater insight into, uh, into um, the impact of programs, but it, it is really a crucial um, tool. Uh, and finally, let's fund extra data collection when there are gaps left by the routine stuff. The, the routine stuff is by no means boring, but it's not always complete. So thank you very much. Oh, okay. My, my, uh, so, Julie, Julie Brotherton and, and uh, Christian Selby, um, Hamad Ali and Scott McGregor, thanks very much for your help with this presentation.